The presentation I'm going to give actually is also too early. It's, um, I would say, two weeks too early that uh, you, Magdalena, you set up this conference for the simple reason that the present and the future of international data transfers might be completely changing in the next two weeks, more specifically on July 16th. And the reason for that is that uh, as, as probably most of you know, on the 16th of July, the Court of Justice in Luxembourg is going to come up with its Trans 2 decision, where it's going to discuss and where it's going to take a decision on quite some crucial aspects and important aspects relating to, to this topic. So, uh, bear with me, I'm going to guide you through what's the current situation, but do please keep in mind that the situation might change uh, on the 16th of July. So, Magdalena, you actually asked me, um, let's see how this works, select slide, next slide. Yes, you asked me if actually on data transfers, obviously from a data protection perspective, uh, if a one-size-fits-all solution uh, would actually exist for data flows. And, and those of you who, who know the GDPR very well know that actually that's not true. It's, it's rather complex, isn't it? Um, and it's such an important topic, data transfers, and on the other hand, we know this, going and reading the GDPR, it's not even defined. We cannot find a definition in the GDPR about what's now a data transfer, and that's really puzzling quite a few companies. Very often, and me as a lawyer, when I'm discussing this with clients, very often clients tell me, yes, of course, that means data transfer means when you really, when you're sending in bulk personal data from Europe to another country outside of Europe. But then if you tell them, and if you discuss with, it, with those companies, that, well, it's not just actively sending that kind of data, but it's also, for example, providing access from outside of European economic area uh, to data which are physically stored, located on a server in Europe, it also would constitute a data transfer. So, for example, if you would be working with a help desk, which would be based, for example, in the Philippines, and they would take over your computer or they would do some tweaking, they would be working on some of the data on your servers based in Europe, it would constitute data transfer and it would trigger uh, that very specific chapter 5 of the uh, GDPR. How do we know that? Well, it's actually based on European case law and more specifically, as you can see here on this slide, it's based on the Lindquist case, a very old case. I'm not going to go into the details of that case. And then the much more recent case, the Schrems case. Then you do find some kind of reasoning which would indeed lead us to this kind of conclusion that Transfer of personal data, it's, it's seen rather broadly. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because it's very strictly regulated what you can do when you want to transfer personal data. And the principle, it's actually, it's mentioned in Article 44 of the GDPR and says that any transfer of personal data which are undergoing processing or intended for processing after transfer to a third country or to an international organization, well, should, shall only take place if and then the following conditions are met, and then that's that whole chapter 5, articles 44 up to, uh, well, article 50, so five long and complex articles that regulate the data transfer. Now, how does it work? Well, I also see in practice that many companies, they say, well, it's simple, isn't it? We just put in our privacy statement that you give consent to us that we are going to transfer your personal data outside of Europe, outside of the European economic area, and so then it's done, isn't it? Well, no, this is not correct. The chapter 5 is actually, it's like an, like an avalanche, it's an escalation procedure that you need to take into account. When you're talking about consent, you're already, as a legal basis for data transfers, you're actually already in the derogations of Article 49 of the GDPR. You can't just skip the other possibilities 
before going and I just go immediately to those derogations. And that's very important. Main principle remains, apparently in Europe, we do not like data to be transferred outside of the European Union, outside of the European economic area. So the principle is no data transfer allowed. Unless, well, the first thing you need to do is to check whether you are going to transfer to a country which is on the so-called white list of countries, where there is an adequacy decision. I'm going to go into these in much more detail, of course, in a few minutes. If you're not going, that's the first exercise you need to do. So if you're not transferring to a data, uh, to a country or a region on the white list, it's only then that you can go to the second step. And what's the second step? Well, you need to look into, or if you are able to apply any kind of appropriate safeguards, appropriate safeguards, which is uh, Article 46 that needs to be applied. Standard contract clauses, that kind of stuff. We'll discuss that also in a minute. And it's only if you've not been able to do, to use this kind of instruments, then you can actually look into the derogations like that consent mechanism or legitimate interest that you find in Article 49. So and that's important to realize because we do, real, we do notice that data protection authorities that are more and more often questioning companies why they immediately moved to the derogations to, to find a legal basis for their data transfer and why they didn't first go and look into the other uh, prioritized alternatives. So let's maybe just let's spend a few minutes on this, this kind of white list of, of countries, regions also nowadays, uh, uh, which have been given an adequacy position, uh, adequate to the GDPR compliance. I know this is probably, this is much more important obviously for, for policymakers and, 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 and countries uh, or, uh, that might be interested in, in, in getting on that list. Um, but still I think it's important also for us uh, business people that, uh, to know actually how it works and, and how cumbersome also it is. Well, first of all, is the European Commission that typically is being lobbied by some third countries uh, who actually would like to put themselves as a candidate and say, well, we believe that our system, our data protection regime is as good as the GDPR, so we want to actually, we want to have a kind of secure layer, secure channel between Europe and our country. So they, they put themselves forward as a candidate. And the European Commission is then going to consider that, is, is, is uh, drafting a proposal, uh, is then sending it to the European Data Protection Board for an opinion. The European Data Protection Board, uh, by the way, has issued some guidelines for third countries, how to do that, how to make up, how to come up with a good, uh, with a good file, with a good kind of submission. And then at the end, it's actually it's the member states who are going to prove whether or not a third country can figure on the list. And so a diverse set of criteria has been used for that. It's typically, it's also by the European Commission, that kind of exercise is typically being outsourced to, to some experts, uh, academics, uh, to do that kind of work. And, and so it's, it's, it's quite intensive. So if you look into, for example, the latest one, Japan, there is a long report an extensive report that is comparing the Japanese legal regime with the European GDPR. So national laws, human rights, that kind of things are then being taken into account. Difference between the GDPR and the former Data Protection Directive is that it's not only any longer about countries, but it could also be one territory within one country that could be put on that white list. Could that be interesting? Sure. Sally, you just discussed the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. Well, for sure, I can imagine, maybe not today, not tomorrow, but in the next few years when the CCPA regime is, is well established and, and is well matured, that the California state of California is going to apply for, um, for an adequacy ruling. And so that would mean that personal data would be safely, legally speaking, of course, could be safely transmitted from Europe to California, which would be an amazing kind of thing because we all know that in California there are many 
data-driven companies uh, doing business in Europe. So it could be country-specific ter uh, territory, as mentioned, also industry-specific, for example, in the aviation industry. It could also, and that's also something new, uh, uh, it also solves the issue with international organizations that actually are being seen as third countries as well. Now, the European Commission has to do some homework after they issue the decision. They need to review their decision every four years, and, and they do that, and, and, and it's it's something uh, which may have uh, quite important consequences because the, this decision can always be repealed. Not retroactively, obviously, but it can be repealed. And um, that risk exists, I would say, if I go to the next slide where I explain uh, the pros and cons of an adequacy decision. Well, we do notice that, that today a few countries um, that are currently on the white list, they, 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 they might risk to, to drop out of the list. Um, for example, Israel is at this very moment is very intensively working with uh, corona tracking apps. And it, is leading uh, to some scrutiny and some negative comments from the policymakers in Europe that these corona, uh, that the way how Israel is dealing with corona is actually is, uh, is, is too privacy intrusive and so that they do risk to, to, to drop off the list um, of, of the adequacy ruling. So these things may happen. Um, Australia, for example, they actually never made it. They, they submitted their, uh, uh, their file a few years ago, but they didn't make it. Um, we see uh, the, the next candidate on the list is South Korea. Well, we do realize, again, because of the very privacy intrusive corona applications that they are putting uh, on the South Korean territory, that also these negotiations, they are becoming much more complex than they would have been just a few months ago. So, adequacy decision, it's a great thing if you are transferring data from Europe to one of those countries that you see here on the list, uh, uh, Japan, New Zealand, Switzerland, uh, uh, Uruguay, etc. That, that's a great thing, Canada, but if you're not on the list, of course, well, then you're stuck and you need to move to the second, uh, to the second alternative. So, and that is appropriate safeguards. What's appropriate safeguards? Well, it's a whole kind of, of, uh, of mechanisms that is working and it is helping us uh, to, uh, to transfer personal data to countries of which we know they do not provide a sufficient degree of protection to personal data once they're stored in that country. So we need to come up with some additional kinds, typically contractual kind of arrangements to make sure that the company importing the data in a third country, that they promise to meet the GDPR requirements themselves by contract. And so here you see the list. So the standard data protection clauses, so standard contract clauses, we find BCRs, binding corporate rules, also some a few new things that have included have been included in the GDPR, like codes of conduct, certification mechanisms, and also something we knew already from the data protection directive, ad hoc contract clauses. So let's also here take a, take a look into each of them to see what actually are their pros, what are their cons. And the first one, it's, it's probably the, the most popular one, it's the SCC, it's the standard contract clauses. And um, we know already several years ago, European Commission, they actually came up with some model contracts with some very specific clauses that actually that make sure that when you sign such kind of contract as an exporting company and as an importing company, that actually that the data subjects that are the subject of such data transfer, that their data tax rights are sufficiently safeguarded even in those countries not having a proper data tax regime. So they need to be included in, in the data processing agreements or in the data sharing agreements, uh, quite often as an annex. Um, important to know is that individuals, they can directly enforce those rights against the data importer as well, on the other side of the ocean, for example. Um, we've got different sets, and so uh, they've been pre-approved by European Commission. I'm sure you know these things, so we've got 
two data sets for controller to controller data transfers, and we've got one for controller to processor data transfers. Now, what's the good thing about standard contract clauses? Well, the good thing is you can have you can have a legitimate ground for transferring personal data in, I would say, less than five minutes. The only thing you need to do, you download that template contract agreement from the European Commission's website, you both, both parties sign, you don't change anything, you just fill out in the, in the annex of the form about what type of data it is, about what's the purpose of the data processing and the data transfer, what are the kind of security measures you got in place, and you can start you can start working on it you can start transferring personal data so you can imagine it's very very uh, business friendly from a pragmatic perspective one piece of warning though what i do know is in practice is that most companies they just sign up and they don't read what actually is written in those standard contracts especially importing companies uh, outside of obviously outside of the European Union, they actually, they say, well, if that's the only thing we need to do, just sign a contract in order to get the data from Europe, let's do that. But what they very often forget to do and what they very often realize, forget to realize, is they, by signing the contract, they promise they will adhere to the principles that we know in Europe on processing and protecting uh, the processing of personal data. Another disadvantage, I would say, of, of uh, standard contract clauses is we don't have standard contract clauses for all uh, types of data transfers. Most specifically, and as mentioned before, we've got controller-to-controller -controller data transfers being covered. We've got controller-to-processor being covered, but we don't have the situation covered of processor-to-processor -processor data transfer agreements nor processor to controller data transfer agreements. The most obvious one and the most challenging one I do see in practice is the processor to processor data transfer situation. What does it mean? Well, it typically means a situation where you've got a company based in Europe working with a subcontractor, a data processor providing services, and that subcontractor says, well, we actually, we work with one of our sister companies or maybe another third party uh, as another subcontractor, and they are based outside of Europe. They're working behind, you don't need to bother about them, no direct contractual arrangement with them, dear customer, don't bother about them. But this is an issue because the processor then is going to transfer personal data to their sub-processor outside of Europe, which constitutes a processor to sub-processor data transfer, not covered by the standard contract clauses. So there's clearly a need to, to, to cover that. Uh, obviously, there's situations to deal with that. I'm not going to go into the details there, but you can, you can solve those issues, but I just want to mention that's one of the, these points of attention. Now, on the next slide, you see another kind, quite interesting uh, legal mechanism to accommodate data transfers, and that is BCRs, binding corporate rules. We already knew the system of BCRs before the GDPR came into the game, um, but it was not in the Data Protection Directive itself. So, this in the GDPR, for the first time, Article 47, now we've got an explicit mentioning of the mechanism of BCRs. And what are they? Well, they're a great mechanism. I mean, it's many companies, they use them as kind of gold plating their uh, data protection regime. Um, they're like a kind of internal code of conduct. So uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of paper, obviously, and so um, it's uh, explaining how you deal internally within your organization with many different legal entities who are spread all over the world, how you deal with personal data. And you need to have that kind of mechanism, that kind of policy, you need to get it approved by the local data protection authority, one or more, they sometimes need to work together if you've got entities in more than one European member state. So it needs to be approved by the Data Protection Authority and then also by the European Data Protection Board, which is going to give a kind of uh, opinion. And then that gives you the right 
to transfer personal data from your company to your sister companies anywhere in the world. Could be in the most terrible regimes out there. No respect at all for data protection. It doesn't matter. This is the BCR is gonna safeguard that kind of principle. Now, that's great, good news. However, quite a few, I would say, disadvantages. I will go into, into the, the, the pros and cons in a minute. Just here on this slide to give you some numbers. So, uh, European Commission has published some numbers about BCRs. They're quite out of date because the latest that I could find were from maybe from May 2018. But here you already notice that it, it's not the big numbers because it's such a cumbersome and complex process, as you can imagine. You need to go and discuss and negotiate with the, with the, with the, the the data protection authority, etc. So about 100 companies, 2018, they already filed and they have been approved. They uh, worked with are working with BCRs. Typically, I would say this is about companies that are active in highly regulated sectors and also that are under higher scrutiny. What do I see? Well, it's just my own list, but I notice quite a lot of companies active in the pharmaceutical sector, healthcare sector, uh, quite a lot of companies active in the financial services, in the legal services, in the telecommunications sector. So you see the usual kind of suspects that uh, do are heavily regulated and also that are having um, intensive international data processing activities. Uh, also some companies like IT service companies, the Cisco's, the IBM's of this world, also publicly listed companies, uh, again because of the higher scrutiny. They really, it's just not only for practical purposes that they go for BCRs, it's also from a reputational perspective uh, that I do notice that. For example, in the, in, the, in the energy sector, for example, I do see most petroleum organizations, companies, they are for BCRs, and so if you're the one left behind and you notice that the other companies, they all went for BCRs, well, you want to have that too, uh, because uh, you want to have, uh, you're always doing some benchmarking. Uh, uh, checking uh, your peers in the same industry sector. Now, what are the good things? Well, the good things I already mentioned about BCRs, it's a global and uniform data detection compliance program within one group. Uh, for sure, it's, uh, you got, and that's a great thing, you will have actually had a discussion with the DPA about your program. Normally you can't do that, as you know, you can't just go to the DPA and say, hey, could you please uh, 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 check if, if everything is right here. You, you probably don't want to have that. So, but here with BCRs, it's a very good way to test the waters with the Data Protection Authority and to have them look into it, to have them tweak and fine tune uh, your own data protection related policies and processes. It's also, uh, you also have the possibility, it's very malleable, so because you have the possibility to come up with your own tools, your own instruments, your own policies and procedures. Now, what are the disadvantages? Well, first of all, I would say, and I've been, uh, I went through a few of these processes, it's very cumbersome. It takes at least two years in order to get your BCRs improved, uh, approved. You, you have a lot of internal policy work to do, and not to forget one of the most important challenges I notice is you need to have all these other sister companies outside of Europe in order for them, for them to adhere to the BCRs, in order for them to sign off on the BCRs. They need to have a self-assessment. They need to go into a compliance exercise themselves. So quite often for the first time, your, your sister company in, in let's say, in, I don't know, in, 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 in the Philippines, in, 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 in Brazil, in Mexico, whatever country outside of Europe, they kind of have to take the GDPR and your BCR translation of the GDPR and put that in place in their own country because otherwise they're not able to receive personal data from the European uh, uh, sister companies. Um, also, something that I've noticed in practice is I already referred to the fact that many companies are using BCRs to show off, to, to, to have their uh, um, data protection compliance exercise gold plated. Well, 
The risk is that DPAs also seek like that. They do claim that if you went for BCRs, you really must be very bold and you must really be very sure about yourself. And so I've seen in practice that companies went even further in the BCRs than what the GDPR is actually requiring. And at the end, the Data Protection Authority was making them accountable for not acting in compliance with the BCRs. And then you can't say, well, the GDPR doesn't really say that it's something that we did, you know, internally because we wanted to make sure that you would be accepting our BCRs. No, that doesn't work any longer. You went for BCRs, you made some very specific promises in the BCRs, you need to keep to those promises. So that's one of those things you need to keep in mind when, when you're going for BCRs. Now another one is uh, codes of conduct. That's really something new and very interesting. So you know it's about it's article, uh, I forgot the name of the, the, the number of the article, but well, you, you, you'll find it in the, uh, in the, in the, in the GDPR. Um, quite often, uh, this article on codes of conduct is forgotten as an appropriate way to transfer data outside of Europe. Very often when we are talking about codes of conduct, it's an industry sector-led initiative indeed, uh, where you do this kind of additional uh, uh, layer on top of the GDPR, a practical way of working with the GDPR within your industry sector. And we all know that the code of conduct, uh, you need to go again to have them approved, you need to go to a specific procedure. Well, one of the less known nice, I would say, features of codes of conduct is that it could serve as a proper legal basis for transferring personal data to companies outside of Europe that also adhere to your code of conduct. And that's a great thing. We're currently doing that in, for a very specific industry sector, and where quite a few uh, uh, industry players are outside of Europe, and so by simply adhering to the code of conduct, they will be able to uh, to receive personal data also outside, uh, uh, being established outside of the European Economic Area. Um, so here on this slide, you do find the the, the pros and cons, and I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna uh, let you read that on your own. Uh, the the slides, as you know, you can download them right now, and also uh, uh, you, they will be found in the package. And then we come to um, the derogations. And here again, I know I'm repeating myself now, but what I do want to stress is their derogations. It's explicitly mentioned in the title also, Article 49, derogations for specific situations. What I do notice though, and that's what you can see here in this slide, is that these derogations are very often used by uh, many companies as the rule in practice. Uh, I gave already the example of, well, let's put consent somewhere and, and, and refine the data transfers. No, derogations under Article 49 are exemptions from the general principle that personal data may only be transferred to a third country if an adequate level of data protection can, is provided for in the third country. And so they really have to be seen as the last resort, can only be used if no other mechanism is available. So important to keep that in mind. And let's, let's maybe see so, uh, um, what actually that it means. Um, one thing that I think is quite peculiar and which we very often tend to forget is that these derogations can only be used for ad hoc processing activities and cannot be used for systematic transfers. On the other hand, one of the, the, the advantages is, well, you don't need to first go to the Data Protection Authority to get an approval, which you would have with BCRs, which you would have with ad hoc contract clauses that I didn't uh, uh, mention. But it's, uh, so the good thing is you don't need to, to bother about that. Again, you can, you can put this in place, but this advantage is you can't do that for your systematic data transfers. It's typically done for ad hoc data transfers. So what does it mean? Well, um, it means that you need to document it. 
you need to show and to be able to show, it's again part of the accountability principle, you need to be able to show that you've done a, an, an exercise, that you first said, well, we cannot check it, or we cannot transfer it to a whitelisted country, we also, we cannot, for this purpose, we cannot use standard contract clauses, or we don't have VCR, that kind of thing, and so that's why now we are looking at Article 49 derogations, and for this very specific situation, we do believe that this, for example, consent, for example, uh, legitimate interest, I'll come back to that in a few seconds, uh, will be used. I just refer to legitimate interest because that's, of course, that's an interesting one. Indeed, Article 49 states you could use legitimate interest for accommodating a data transfer. Here again, I've seen many companies say, well, we found it, let's, let's make it easy, let's keep it easy. We, we believe it's in our legitimate interest to transfer those data to, to, let's say, our mother company on the other side of the ocean. Can't do that. Because, and this is the last paragraph of Article 49, it's very, very peculiar situations in which you can use legitimate interest. And so I'm just again going to, uh, uh, to, to the, and I'm just going to read it out loud because it's so important because I think it's too often being misused. So where a transfer could not be based on a provision on Article 45, 46, nor uh, the ones that I just mentioned, consent and, and uh, uh, vital interests, etc. Well, you could use legitimate, legitimate interest but only if the transfer is not repetitive, only if it concerns a limited number of data subjects, only if it's necessary for the purposes of compelling legitimate interests, which are not overridden by the interests, rights and freedoms of the data subjects. And the controller has assessed all circumstances surrounding the data transfer and has on that basis of that assessment provided suitable safeguards with regard to the protection of personal data. So you know this. Yes, you can use legitimate interest, but only under very specific circumstances and only after you've done a very proper self-assessment and have documented that self-assessment. So then about Article 49, the derogations. That's about everything I would say I wanted to discuss about the general principles of, of transfers of personal data. So this kind of pronged approach, so the, the escalation, the phased approach. But I would like to spend a few minutes now to go with you on the review of the privacy shield because this is indeed uh, something that is happening at the moment. I already referred to the Schrems 2 case. And so, um, we all know that based on Trump's one, safe harbor was annulled and invalidated, and so we then ended up with an agreement of decision European Commission on Privacy Shield already in 2016. I'm sure I don't need to go into the details. You all know how the Privacy Shield works, and it's a kind of self-assessment procedure for companies based in the United States, and so if they feel sufficiently comfortable that they are meeting the requirements of the privacy shield criteria, they can actually can get that kind of certificate, that kind of privacy shield, shield certificate, giving them the possibility to receive personal data from uh, the European Economic Area. Important to know is that if they do something wrong, they're not only going to be running the risk to be sanctioned by a European Data Protection Authority, but also by the United States authorities. At least that's the principle. Well, the European Commission needs to come out on an annual basis with an annual review, and, and maybe it doesn't come as a surprise, but until now they always stated, well, privacy shield still going on. Well, yes, we do have some comments, we do have some suggestions, but actually, uh, yes, the US continues to provide an adequate level of protection for data transfer from the EU to the US under the privacy shield. Uh, they, they, again, I mentioned they do have, you can read at it, they, they, they do have some practical suggestions, for example, apparently there is an issue, it's because it's a self-certification. 
certification scheme. So uh, there is an issue of uh, false certification. So uh, companies, they claim their privacy shield certified, but actually they're not. And so tools should be developed to, to closely monitor to that kind of things. Um, again, as mentioned, the privacy shield, I'll get back to that in a minute, is going to, uh, um, uh, to, to be discussed by the Court of Justice. Magdalena, you are coming up, and that means that I need to hurry, isn't it? Exactly. If we, we, we would like to have a few minutes for discussion, so if, if you could kindly, um, uh, in two, three minutes... I'll do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, sorry for that. I'm always getting too enthusiastic and I'm, stick to, I'm sticking too long with a few of these slides. Apologies for that. But I've, I've made sure that uh, I've put sufficient information, and not just a few keywords, but sufficient information on the slide so you can read these things for yourself. So maybe just a few words on Brexit and on what's going to happen. Uh, one minute on Brexit. Well, we all know that we're now in the transition period, and during this transition period, we still have uh, uh, the GDPR being applicable. Uh, but after the transition period, probably uh, on the 1st of January 2021, let's see what's going to happen on the 1st of July, but pro so probably the 1st of January 2021, we really, we are not going to have the GDPR applicable any longer. And United Kingdom, from, from the UK's perspective, they already stated, well, uh, we at least, we are not going to apply restrictions for incoming data from Europe, from the European Union to the United Kingdom. Also, we are going to continue to rely on the privacy shield. Uh, we, we may have to make a few tweaks there, but uh, so the same principles we are going to apply at least from a UK perspective. What they're also going to do is uh, they are going to perform their own adequacy. Uh, assessments and then, for example they're also going to, to assess the EU data protection regime in order to see if it's sufficiently meeting the UK uh, data protection requirements. Probably they're also going to apply for an adequacy decision. Uh, well, let's see how it goes. So to be put on that first list of, of, of countries, um, I can also imagine they would go for a kind of agreement as the United States, a privacy shield for the United Kingdom. Let's see how it goes. We don't know yet. Um, what we do know, though, is that the European Data Protection Board is a little bit concerned, or is, I would say more than just a little bit, because of the agreement that the UK entered into with the United States on, uh, um, on uh, giving access to, to, to personal data for uh, counter, uh, well, for, for uh, fighting uh, anti-terrorism. So let's see how that discussion is going. So that actually, very shortly indeed, about, uh, about uh, uh, Brexit. Now, what's going to happen with Trump's G? Well, we, we all know about what happened a few years ago, five years ago, with Trump's one, Safe Harbor got invalidated, and of course, Max, he said, well, that's not the end of my story, that's not the end of my fight, and he launched a second kind of procedure where he is finding now the standard contract clauses mechanism, because you can imagine after Safe Harbor got invalidated some years ago, many companies, they turned to standard contract as the legal base for data transfers. Well, this discussion or this situation is now being put on the desk of the Court of Justice and uh, Max Schrand, he also, he added on top of that question relating to the validity of standard contract clauses, he also added now the privacy shield uh, 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 agreement. So these two topics are going to be discussed uh, um, on the 16th of July, well, be decided, they have already been discussed. And on this slide you will see uh, some key takeaways from um, Henrik Sagmansgaard, who uh, is the Advocate General, and he came uh, about a few months ago, he gave his opinion, as you know, this is the, typically the case for court cases at the Court of Justice, and here on this slide you do see the five key takeaways, which are, are quite interesting. I'm not going to be able to go into those, but you see that actually that uh, he's a bit afraid of making uh, taking a position on privacy shield. He says, I don't want to take a formal decision on privacy shield, but I'm, if you court, if you judges are going to take a decision, well, I would say that there are some doubts about the validity. 
interesting. About standard contract clauses, he says, well, it's a valid mechanism. It should remain a valid mechanism. Um, but um, he puts the burden on the data exporter to make sure that in the country where the data importer is established, that there are no laws in that country that would make it possible or impossible to enforce the uh, clauses and the obligations of the standard contract clauses. So, and that brings me to the end, Magdalena, because we don't know, I don't know, nobody knows, I suppose, except the judges, if they already uh, uh, made up their mind, um, uh, what is going to be decided on the 16th of July. So, I just thought about five different kind of scenarios what could happen. So, the first one would be that, well, Yes, the, the court would follow the Advocate General's opinion, say, well, standard contract clause, and it's still a valid mechanism, but indeed it's to companies and also data protection authorities, they have a responsibility to make sure that it's not just a piece of paper, but it can also really be enforced by the, the, the importer, and so that the importer can't say, well, sorry, I did sign that contract, that standard contract, uh, clauses contract, but actually it can't be enforced because my national law is prohibiting me to follow those rules. Uh, a scenario two uh, would be that actually the, the court would say, well, it's the commission who has to do some homework. Uh, you need to come up with a list of countries where standard contract clauses cannot be used for because of their own national laws. Another scenario would be that the uh, court would say, well, no, standard contract clauses, no, not, not at all, it's, I'm going to annul it ex tunc, so even retroactively, would be crazy, I'm sure they're not going to do that. But it might be that they would go for scenario 4, which would be ex nunc. Or scenario 5, it would be a status quo, they would say, well, it's, uh, it doesn't, uh, we're not going to discuss it at all, uh, and they might come up with a good reasoning, uh, politically inspired maybe, but a good legal reasoning as well, to say that it should be stated, and the European Commission should actually come up with new standard contract clauses, uh, which are in line with the GDPR, and not uh, any longer based on the old data protection directive. On Privacy Shield, um, also a few scenarios, uh, more or less the same, they could decide that it falls outside the scope of the case, would be a political kind of discussion, so stay away from that discussion. Or again, as with Safe Harbor, they could annul it ex nunc et tunc. Or they could also say, no, it can stay there, but this and this and this point should be addressed by the United States administration. If that's done, we can live with uh, a privacy shield agreement. And then actually, Magdalena, it brings me to the end, and I apologize for having used some additional minutes uh, to go through this slide set. I hand over back to you.